This video contains spoilers for the movie Scream. We know so little about who the knight is in Deltarune, except for the fact that he's almost certainly Alvin, and Gerson is secretly J.R.R. Tolkien, and Asgore cheated on Toriel with Ru- Oh, oh, you didn't know that? Well, that means you didn't watch my first night video, which definitely does not actually make those claims, but you should still go watch it now. But on a more serious note, that night video I made, while I focused on discussing some of the more widely debated candidates, ended up missing a number of possibilities, including a bunch of options I'd consider to be wild cards. So I decided to reopen the investigation, and dedicate this video to discussing some of the more out there night possibilities. Not only that, but since these are pretty crazy ideas, I'll be creating a unique theory for every single candidate, no matter how unlikely, trying my hardest to make a case for them. My name is Spooky Dude, and I recently read a report that the people who subscribe to my channel and leave a like are scientifically guaranteed to have their theories come true, so I recommend you subscribe. Without further ado, let's discuss. Before that though, we need to talk. See, recently I've been getting the desire to expand my gaming palette, if you will, and play other RPGs with awesome world building and fun combat, preferably on the go. If you're like me and you're looking for something like that, well, I've got great news for you, because this video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is an awesome tactical RPG with a wide range of strategies, PvP, and PvE game modes, champions to play as, and more. There are over a million possible team builds in Raid Shadow Legends, and over 700 champions to choose from, so if you're looking for a game with lots of depth, they've got you covered. Face off against epic boss battles to gain XP, loot, and more. I'm sure you guys, like me, are fans of challenging bosses, and Raid has those too. One of the most challenging bosses is the Hydra, with multiple heads. Hydra is a super difficult boss with six heads. The Head of Blight is poisonous, slowly seeping your health while protecting itself from damage. The Head of Torment is constantly inflicting fear on your champions. The Head of Mischief is after your buffs. The Head of Wrath is the damage dealer of the bunch. It weakens and provokes your team. The Head of Decay tears you down while building up its allies. The Head of Suffering is, in my opinion, the Hydra's strongest weapon. It brings with it a new debuff called Pain Link, which causes your champion to take damage whenever you attack the Head of Suffering. Who here is a fan of Jontron? Well, for new players to raid Shadow Legends, you can get your hands on the awesome Stag Knight, one of the best champions in the game, as well as a skin for Stag Knight designed by Jontron himself. All you need to do is use the promo code JTSKIN before October 7th, and don't worry if you miss it, you can still get Stag Knight and the skin through an in-game event. Say you've fought the Hydra already, and faced off against other clans, and you're still hungry for new Raid Shadow Legends and game content. Now you can do both of those things at the same time. Hydra Clash is a new clan-based competition. You and four other clans can see who can hit the Hydra the hardest. There's tons of great rewards on the line, so get you and your clanmates ready. With all this exciting stuff and more coming to Raid, if you haven't started playing, then what are you waiting for? Use my link in the description below or scan my QR code to get insanely awesome bonuses. We're talking an epic champion, Knight Errant, one of my favorites, and other useful things like energy refills and an XP booster. Come find me in the game under the name Spooky Dude, and if you're fast enough, you can join my clan. Click the link in the description and I'll join you on the battlefield. I think there's no better way to start this video than with Rules Card. Everyone in the comments of that last video kept telling me I forgot him, so okay, okay, I'll give him a chance. And to be honest, as insane as it is, Rules actually does have a chance. To start off the case for Rules Card, I'd like to bring up this awkwardly worded Shom conversation. When Shom tells us about the knight entering Card Kingdom, he says, Recently, a strange knight appeared, and three of the kings were locked away. The remaining king put him and his strange son into power. This seemingly is saying that the knight locked away the three kings, while the spade king then put himself and Lancer into power. While this interpretation does make sense, and is widely agreed upon, there is an alternate reading. Sean saying that a strange knight appeared, three of the kings were locked away, the remaining king put him and his strange son into power, it kind of makes it sound like the him is referring to the knight. As in, the knight appeared, locked away kings, the spade king put the knight and his strange son into power. Shom saying the knight is strange, followed by the statement that his son is strange, also seems to imply that the person who has a strange son is the strange knight. Furthermore, Rules is called Lesser Dad by Lancer, and frequently takes care of him, treating him like a son. Wait a minute, Rules' initials are RK. Remaining king? Roaring knight? A knight serves under the king, as does Rules, and Rules' entire goal is to serve the most evil ruler. His accent sounds like a medieval knight, he has long arms, he also implies he has a more powerful true form we don't get to see. The game won't stop bringing up Rule's card and reminding us he exists, which may be because it's setting up for a big twist. 
Okay, come on. I honestly would love to make an entire video about how Rules is secretly the knight, but I just can't. I know the fanbase loves the idea, I know a lot of you guys love the idea, but I can't defend it. First of all, the evidence is really weak. Sham talking about the king getting locked away is, is very, very clear. The strange knight appeared and locked three kings away. That's one statement with one idea. Afterwards, the remaining king put him and his strange son into power. This is clearly saying that the Spade King put himself and Lancer into power. Don't believe me? Well, just ask Rules, who tells us that he took this high-ranking position because he thought he could overthrow King from the inside. He actually doesn't like King. He talks about his son, referring to King's son, being Lancer, clearly explaining King is his father, not Rules. Furthermore, the initials being the same as the Roaring Knight obviously mean nothing. It's a total coincidence. Rules also lacks a determination to open up a dark fountain, and we know this because in the real world when he's in our pocket, he turns into a rules card. A, a rules card, a R-U-L-E-S card, not like his name. Even if somehow he had taken a soul and does have the determination, he still turns to stone in Chapter 2's Dark Fountain. In my opinion, there's next to no actual evidence supporting the idea that rules card is the knight. Yes, I do think he'll be important. No, I wouldn't even be surprised if he ends up as a really challenging super boss towards the end of the game. However, I do not think he's the knight. But, like I said, I have to come up with a theory for everyone. If I was forced to create some theory, some argument as to how he could logically end up being the knight, well, I would reveal that Rules has been lying this entire time, and that the crown we see him use to control K round is the same crown powering up King. It's a mind control crown, and it allows King to be strong enough to beat us, and it's what Rules is using to puppeteer King behind the scenes. Rules does have a soul, however he chooses to remove this soul, putting it back in only when he deems it necessary, using it to give him the power of a lightener and open up dark worlds. As far as story goes, I'd probably imply that Rules once got in contact with Gaster, who eventually decides that Rules was a waste of his time, and instead turned his attention towards Jevil. Rules, desperate to serve under Gaster and be given the same power Gaster clearly has, kills a Lightener, takes their soul, and has been using it to open up Dark Worlds, searching for that all-powerful ruler once more. After searching all these Dark Worlds and not finding him, he'll fully commit to the act, causing the Roaring, believing that Gaster's power can still save him. However, he will never actually find Gaster. This, of course, is absolutely wild and totally unrealistic, but again, I'm forcing myself to come up with these theories here. I guess a simpler version is Rules desperately wants to serve the strongest ruler possible, so he's opening up Dark Fountains to find them, though them being the Titans, but even this is unrealistic. As I said, I think Rules Knight is incredibly unlikely. Next up, I'd like to talk about Ice E. Yes, that Ice E. You'd be surprised, Ice E is actually tied to some of the deepest mysteries in Deltarune and Undertale. <laughs> With all this talk about Sans coming from Deltarune and, you know, jumping to Undertale, I think it's interesting that Icy is on Sans' crossword puzzle in his only Undertale appearance. Icy is all over the Deltarune light world. He's in movies, on products, owns restaurants. He seems to be more popular than Mickey Mouse is in our world. But what makes it more interesting is that he's also in the Dark Worlds. In Cyber City, Icy is shown during the letter scramble with a combination of letters that are very similar to his signature catchphrase, except for one letter. Ice E simply existing in the Dark Worlds is already suspicious. Even more interesting in the Spamton sweepstakes, there's a story from a young Noelle. She talks about how one night it was dark and she went to eat leftover pizza, when the Ice E on the pizza box winked at her. She screamed and only Des believed her. Des then went on to burn the box, specifically Ice E's eyes, but then he looked, according to Noelle, evil. Noelle, Des, Chris, and Asriel went to try and bury the box, until Chris wore the box like a mask over their face to scare Noelle. Hijinks ensued, and Des threw the box away. What's most interesting about this blog post, though, isn't the insinuation that evil flaming eyes Ice E is hiding in the graveyard somewhere, but instead the way the sighting report ends. See, this was submitted to a site that reports sightings of Ice E. The end of the blog post says, and I quote, For those that enjoyed these sightings, be sure to take a look at the ones from her sister. This link leads to Deltarune.com slash December, which is the page cannot be found page. Everyone speaks about how this page is just further proof that Des has been gastered, but you all forget something really interesting that this implies. Supposedly, this December page originally contained information on Ice E sightings of her own. December was older than Noel at the time. Based on the logic the game presents, uh, at that time Des would probably be around Chris's age now, maybe a little younger. 
If Des frequently saw Ice E, what exactly could that mean? It ties into the Ice E cryptid thing. In Noelle's room, one of the items shows that Noelle searched up Is Ice E Real Cryptid? If Ice E is able to go between the light and the dark worlds, is well known and being brought up over and over so we don't forget who he is, and has connections to all the main characters in numerous ways, him being the knight makes perfect sense. Now, personally, I believe that Ice E is super important. Super important. And I'd love to do a video on him at another time. However, the very simple fact is, I believe the whole Ice E cryptid thing has two possible outcomes. Either A, Ice E isn't a real cryptid, however Noelle frequently seeing him is actually her seeing someone else, or B, Ice E is a running gag set to be paid off through some crazy moment later in the game, maybe as a boss in a dark world or something. I think that the biggest problem with Ice E Knight is his lack of character. While it would be incredibly funny and crazy if he was revealed to be the Knight, we don't know anything about him, so it would pretty much just be like making the Knight a brand new character with a tiny bit of joke buildup. Ice E is supposed to be a brand mascot with movies made about him. It doesn't make much sense for him to be intertwined in this small town problem. But let's play along for a minute. If I was forced to, how would I go about theorizing that Ice E is the Knight? Something I find very interesting about Ice E's pizza is that all the employees are required to wear Ice E costume heads, which is really odd. However, Warrior, the guy slamming this pizza, seemingly has an Ice E head, not a costume mask. How could this be unless the Warrior is whatever kind of monster Ice E is? Perhaps Warrior is helping Ice E from the inside, alongside whatever Nightmare is. Ice E is opening up these dark worlds, though not to cause the roaring. It's to build an Ice E themed world, simply to grow the brand. He's got the Sigma grind set going, and he won't stop until an icy fueled world completely consumes everything. Although, this entire line of thinking is so stupid, and it's literally all I could come up with. Icy is not the knight. There's just not enough I could possibly come up with. In my opinion, I actually think Icy's pizza is going to be the location of the Chapter 5 Dark World, and that Icy will be some kind of super boss. And while I've personally claimed due to chess theory that Chapter 5 will be the knight fight, if it's really not the knight fight, chess theory could always still work by having us fight the fake knight, Icy. But that's literally all I have for Icy. This brings me to the multi-knight theory. This in and of itself could be its own video. Essentially, this theory states that there's more than one knight. Not the most hard to imagine thing in the world, while it's hard to imagine anyone besides Alvin at the moment being the knight, if two or more characters are the knight and there's some underlying truth we don't know, there are so many doors that open for us. Maybe it's Asgore and Mayor Holiday looking for deaths. Maybe it's a Lightener Knight and a Darkener Knight. Maybe it's Chris and Asriel. I mean, the possibilities are endless. It also has the same benefits that the movie Scream had in 1996, when it was revealed that the answer to its whodunit slasher premise is not one but two characters, each with their own reasons for doing it. Now, at numerous points throughout the story, when you say to yourself, oh, well, it can't be Stu because there's the killer and there's Stu, you were setting yourself up for a giant swerve. Deltarune has us discounting people left and right for timeline-related reasons, but if there's two knights, then suddenly it makes a bit more sense. As to who the two knights are? Well, I have no idea. Your guess is just as good as mine. But it's an idea that does have merit, and I'd be interested in hearing what you guys think about it. That being said, Toby did say in the original intro the knight singular was standing at the top of the stairs. And other characters have only spoken about one singular knight, even those who supposedly don't know who the knight is. But still, I think it's not the worst idea in the world. So let's come up with a theory for this. And I think I'm actually going to give you two variations. First, the pretty basic one. The two knights are the mayor and Asgore. The mayor is searching for December, harshly attacking anyone who challenges her. She's wiped out the three kings, proving herself to be better at combat, perhaps to interrogate them or find out some information about Des. Asgore, too, is looking for Des. He's specifically less interested in making his presence known, though, hence why he doesn't have much of an impact in the dark world he opened, the Chapter 2 Dark World. Alright, nice, that one's, you know, pretty serviceable, but let's take this concept to a different level. There are two knights throughout two different time periods. Gaster was the original knight. Back when Toriel, Asgore, Caddy's dad, Rudy, Gerson, QC, and the Mare all discovered the Dark Worlds. They went on their own adventure, attempting to discover who this knight is. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, after an incident involving Chris, Noel, Des, and Asriel snooping where they shouldn't have, a confrontation led to Des going missing. After discovering Gaster is the one behind these Dark Worlds, the adults confront Gaster, and he fights back, ultimately leading them to try and banish him into the depths. The four kids, trying to see what's happening, accidentally end up in the crossfire, with December falling into the depths alongside Gaster. Years later, 
The kids have forgotten the events that night. Chris and Asriel didn't see enough, and Noel, as you know, tends to forget these kinds of things. All of these characters besides them, though, remember the Dark Worlds, specifically the Mare. Now, despite Gaster's banishment into the Deaths and the world no longer in danger, the Mare has been opening up these Dark Worlds, searching for her daughter. Okay, well, I asked you guys for some crazy night ideas on Twitter, and I got some amazing answers. Let's rapid fire a few. Starwalker. He appears in both chapters as an optional side character. He isn't seen in your inventory in the light world. He kind of looks like a save point. Obviously this is a no, but if I had to come up with something, maybe he's attempting to cause the roaring because the light world is pissing him off. Ralsei's hat? Because it was discarded? Okay, I can't pretend like that's not a super fun idea. While I don't think it's the knight, a future fight with Ralsei's hat would be kind of genius. Maybe he possesses our party members one at a time and turns them into shadow versions of themselves or something. I don't know, I'm just coming up with stuff. In terms of theorizing, I'd say he's the knight because he wants to be worn by the titans. He thinks it would make him look nice. Here's an interesting one. The eggs are shattered pieces of the knight's soul, and the man giving them to us is a servant looking to revive him. This is a super interesting concept, and there's lots of potential here. That being said, the knight is actively opening Dark World, so unless his soul continues to be losing pieces throughout the game, it, it just doesn't really make sense. Similarly, if there's an egg in Chapter 3, it would disprove this theory, unless, of course, Chris is the knight. Overall, though, this is a great idea and a cool thought. I do think the eggs are going to be important on that level. This is one where I can't really come up with a theory for, as the idea itself is pretty much the theory. Here is my favorite. Temi, because the knight draws the fountains from the earth, and Temi does the art for Deltarune, so she draws the fountains. Congratulations, you, you did it, you created the greatest night theory. This is it, I can't even top this, so I'm not going to try. Next up is an idea I want to briefly touch on, and that's the idea that there's no night, that there isn't a singular candidate who is the night, and instead these dark fountains are being opened by various other characters, all of whom are the night of their own personal worlds. I like the idea, but I'm going to say no just for a couple minor reasons. I think that Toby saying that the intro has the knight at the top of the stairs, it kind of makes me think that, you know, there is one knight. Similarly, characters are talking about the knight and the roaring knight, and I think the knight in general ties too much into the roaring and the general idea of Deltarune's story for me to say, oh yeah, you know, the knight is nobody. You know what I mean? It's just, it doesn't really sit right with me. Finally, I'd like to touch on a strange, yet somehow more believable candidate. Everyman. Everyman, for those who don't know, made his debut in Undertale's True Lab as an attack, not a full character. He's the main attack of the Reaper Bird, walking towards the player, either shooting his heads at you or being swarmed by these butterflies. In Deltarune, despite not having a reason to show up, he makes a few appearances as well. During Jevil's carousel attack, one of the duck's heads may be replaced by Everyman, Graffiti and Hometown in the text Everyman also appear in the back wall of the Hometown Alley. Everyman has a chance to appear in the pop-up windows of Pop-Up's Pop-Up Attack. Everyman's also able to appear in Queen's Drama Attack, and unlike the other heads, he doesn't emit any words. And finally, he was shown in the Spamton Sweepstakes. Everyman's sprites refer to him as Strange Man in the Undertale's Code, though Toby Fox has clarified he's called Everyman. Strange Man? Strange Knight? Just something to think about. Every man is, similar to Ice E, appearing in both Light and Dark Worlds. Unfortunately, we know even less about him than we do Ice E. Every man does, however, appear to take a shape similar to the knight's chess piece. So far, there's not really much evidence. But there is still a weird connection to make. A morality play is a genre of medieval and early Tudor drama. The term describes a genre of play from the 14th through 16th centuries that feature personified concepts like virtues, vices, habits, beliefs, alongside angels and demons, who are engaged in a struggle to persuade a protagonist, who represents a generic human character, towards good or evil. One such play is known as the Summoning of Everyman, or simply Everyman. The play uses allegorical characters to examine the question of Christian salvation, and what man must do to attain it. The plot is as follows. God is upset that humans have become too absorbed in material wealth and riches to follow him, so he sends Death to go to every man and summon him to heaven to make his reckoning. Death tells every man it's time to die, and every man is distressed. Death says he can't delay this, however, he'll allow every man to find a companion to go on the journey with him. 
Every man has a friend called Fellowship who has promised to go anywhere with him. However, once every man tells him the nature of his journey, Fellowship refuses to go. A few more people refuse to go, including Goods, Kindred, and Cousin. Cousin explains that nobody will accompany every man because they have their own accounts to write as well. Finally, every man convinces Good Deeds to come along with him, but she's too weak. He asks God for forgiveness and repents his sins. After he's absolved of his sins, Good Deeds is strong enough to accompany every man on his journey with death. A whole bunch of other things happen that aren't important. <laughs> At the end of the road, the only person able to accompany him is Good Deeds. Not even knowledge can stay with him. Every man dies alongside Good Deeds, and they are welcomed into heaven by an angel. The play ends when a doctor enters and explains that, in the end, a man will only have his good deeds to accompany him beyond the grave. This play has very obvious surface-level ties to both Undertale and, well, probably Deltarune. The point of every man is very similar to the point of Undertale. Do good deeds because at the end of the day, those will be the only things that stay with you after your death. While obviously not the exact same as what Pacifist is trying to promote, the idea of a story about morality focusing on the fact that your good deeds will be judged and are important is really similar. Every man somehow referencing the idea behind Undertale's morality system makes perfect sense. That being said, it makes a bit less sense applied to Deltarune. There are a lot of large-scale ideas you can apply to the Everyman play. A story about God seeking every man to face judgment? Well, maybe it's the Roaring. But then again, it doesn't truly line up in any meaningful way. Sure, I guess it could be referencing the idea that Deltarune might be about how we'll all face judgment at the end of the day for our actions, but that doesn't really feel like it's what Deltarune is about. I don't know. It seems to me like analyzing this everyman play and trying to line it up with Deltarune yields only weak connections. Until you start to try and line it up a little bit more literally. I'm going to list you a number of characters in the everyman play. This information is taken from numerous sources discussing the original play. Fellowship is unwilling to join every man as he doesn't want to die. He's only willing to help every man for his own amusement or for the sake of violence. Goods is the personification of wealth. Every man believes that he is the owner of goods and that goods will help him because he's loved goods all his life. Until it's revealed, goods is a deceiver. In reality, every man's love of goods has been leading him towards damnation. Goods reveals he deceives people to steal their souls. There are a lot more interesting things. The angel is the being that welcomes every man to heaven at the end of the story. The final character who shows up in the entire story, who explains the moral to the audience? The doctor. There's a lot of minor things as well. After repenting for his sins to confession, knowledge bestows every man with a garment of sorrow. At one point, every man goes towards a priest, and Five Wit gives a speech about the superiority of priests, claiming that they're above angels in degree. As tied up as I am here with this super convoluted thing, the game doesn't actually need to be a literal parallel to work. Ralsei has told us a number of things about doing good deeds. According to him, Chris, I believe your choices are important too. This world is full of all kinds of people. In the end, how we treat them makes all the difference. So let's try our best to get by without fighting. If we can manage to do that, I believe this tale may have a happy ending. Otherwise, I fear that you may not find the results favorable. This is quite literally the main moral idea behind the summoning of every man. We're presented with a solid end goal, the Roaring, a world-ending event, and being told that our choices don't matter, except Ralsei, who explains our choices do matter, the choice we make to be good to others. Perhaps Deltarune isn't a literal interpretation of the summoning of every man. Maybe it's a twist in which a false god has sent death to collect every man only for the game to let us fight him and give everyone a second chance. Maybe the people we were good to will help us at the end of the day. Maybe our allies will leave us and we will separate from Chris, and all that will be left is our actions. After all, look at Castletown. It's not called Castletown at all, is it? For me, it's Spooky Dude Town. This isn't a town owned by Chris or Ralsei. It's a living record of our actions, our good deeds. In that way, it could also be the opposite. Ralsei says that not fighting will lead to a happy ending, and maybe that's true. Maybe building a huge populated city of characters that show our good deeds can somehow help us survive. What matters most, I think, is that a game teasing every man with the story of a god leading a person to the end of the world, in which they're told the only thing that matters the most is their good deeds, is certainly, at the very least, interesting. There are a million different ways to tie Deltarune characters to the characters from every man. There is one problem with this, though. And that's the fact that Undertale's entire message was that your good deeds are what matter. 
Now, I personally believe the point of Undertale isn't that pacifism is great or good deeds themselves are important. I think it's the fact that we have the determination to choose those things. It's not pacifism that Undertale promotes, but instead the act of choosing it. Either way, good deeds and pacifism were at the forefront of Undertale. And for Deltarune to have mostly the same point seems really odd. And yeah, that's true, but an interpretation doesn't need to parrot the same message as the original. As a matter of fact, there's merit in creating an interpretation for the sole purpose of saying the opposite as the original. If I wanted to, I could make an interpretation of Rocky, one of the biggest underdog films of all time that has the message of going the distance and not giving up. And instead, I could make an interpretation that shows Rocky with insanely high medical bills. His big match doesn't sell tickets, and he gets the crap kicked out of him, with the message of, give up on your stupid dreams, the world isn't made for you. Obviously, that's a message I don't like or agree with. However, this would still make it an interpretation of Rocky. Perhaps this is similar. Deltarune is an interpretation of the summoning of every man. However, it has an alternate message. Doing good deeds for the purposes of self-saving avoids fighting, which in turn stops major issues from ever being solved. Maybe Toby's making the bold claim that real change requires force sometimes, and that being hardcore pacifist for the sake of feeling good about yourself only hurts people in the long run. Maybe the pacifist route will be a bad ending, with Snowgrave being the other extreme, showing that pure force will lead you nowhere. Maybe there's a third pure route that has you fighting when necessary, and doing as many good deeds as possible that leads to the true ending, showing that what matters most isn't being one extreme or the other. It's understanding that while pacifism is blanket statement good, sometimes you need to use force. Now again, I'm not necessarily agreeing with this sentiment, I'm just theorizing. The problem with this whole thing is that I'm sure less than 2% of you are listening and saying, oh my god, that's it, you solved it. And the reason is because bringing up similarities between these two entirely different pieces of fiction and claiming that Deltarune is a modern everyman interpretation is crazy. And as wild as crazy as all the fun, you know, links are, it's the same as any other weird parallel. While it seems to make some sense at certain points in time, it's most likely nothing. I stumble on these weird things all the time, like these, oh my god, this changes everything, it's all connected things, that make me say I've solved Deltarune. But while there's a lot to discuss, the biggest problem is at the very source of this theory. The only confirmed tie this play actually has to Deltarune is the word everyman. And while it's interesting that there's a lot of stuff that might line up, I can't pretend like this really means anything. It's cool and it's fun to talk about, but so are a lot of weird parallels. Here's the thing. All stories are cut from the same cloth, and oftentimes two stories about the same topic will tread the same ground. There are character archetypes, statements on the nature of being a good person, vague descriptions of what God is looking for in you that may just happen to coincide between two stories. But that doesn't mean they're somehow connected. Here's a fun fact. I made my Angel's Hell theory about how Gaster will play into Deltarune, and shortly after posting it, I watched Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. I was shocked to find out this movie has exactly the same plot as Angel's Hell, like down to specific character roles. For a good two hours I thought to myself, oh my god, I solved Deltarune, this has to be it, before realizing, wait a minute, this Star Trek movie having the same plot as my fan theory of Deltarune doesn't actually mean anything. If anything, it means that I came up with a story that another person came up with when presented with the same concepts and character types. So, while this everyman play is really cool and interesting, take it all with a grain of salt. Here's the thing, I'm going to go out of my way and say that everyman is not the knight, because even if he is, we're still left with a shell of a character. Okay, everyman is the knight, now what? Who is everyman, even? Sure, the whole play thing is interesting, but it doesn't tell us anything about the in-universe everyman. Similarly, if he was a product of amalgamation, those experiments didn't happen in the Deltarune universe, meaning he somehow has to be created in an entirely different way. I don't know, it's just all too weird for me. But like I said, I have to create a theory for every character, and this one is no exception. Okay, so maybe every man is the concept of final judgment and your good deeds being the most important thing. Maybe he's opening these up not because he has some physical plot-related desires, but instead because he's some kind of cryptid-like entity from the void, similar to Homestuck's horror terrors. His goal as an entity is to guide people to death and to be judged by God. Of course, if he comes from the deaths, then in this case it would be Gaster rather than an actual god, but whatever. The reason he's going through the Dark Worlds and putting specific plans into place isn't because he has some kind of complex desire, but instead to guide those people who are unjust and carrying bad vices into realizing the truth he once learned. There's only one thing that stays with you in death, and it's good deeds. 
He's helped Susie, Noelle, and will most likely continue to help other characters grow across the rest of the story. He isn't exactly good, but he's not exactly evil. His desires are to give those who are near death a chance to make it to heaven. And that's all I can come up with. So, do with that information what you will. While every man is certainly interesting, I think there's a high chance he ends up being like so many other weird little Toby Fox Easter eggs. Just an Easter egg. I think that's all I have to say about these crazy candidates. Overall, while they're not the most well-loved knight candidates, all of them have some pretty good arguments. What do you think? Tell me in the comments below who your totally out there candidates are for the knight. And don't forget to use my Raid Shadow Legends link in the description or scan this QR code to get insane bonuses for new players and an epic champion. Thanks again to Raid for sponsoring this video. Make sure to like and subscribe and thank you for watching. My name is Spooky Dude and I'll see you all next time.